Let's waste no time. Let's go straight to him because there he is. He is online. Jason Costigan. Got a couple of the different aspects to this, Costo. First, simply being that uh, that grand final, Penrith are a machine. They smashed them. They never let them in for a second. Well, I said on my Twitter feed after the game, well, I, I'm not even sure if I actually waited for full time, but Marty, they are a superpower. Last night was confirmation that Penrith is a superpower. For your listeners that don't know much about the geography of Sydney, in that Golden West, they just have a, well, a munitions factory, if I could use a wartime analogy. It's a production line of players. They cleaned up in all the lower grades with the Jersey flag, I think the Harold Matthews, the New South Wales Cup, the NRL. That just, it's just a wall of black, and they just, it shows no signs of abating. And it was interesting to see the CEO the other day before the grand final saying we're going to keep churning our players. We'll lose a couple every year because of salary cap. But last night, they just showed they're a cut above the rest. And I don't want to moan about it, but I'm sure the Cowboys would have put up a better show than Parramatta. They were very disappointing, but full credit to Penrith. They were just awesome. Uh, they're just a wrecking ball, aren't they? Once they get going, it just, they just seem impossible to stop. And not only not only with the ball, but without the ball, I thought their defence, their line speed especially, just the vigour and enthusiasm at it, they were just in their face right from the time the Eels got the ball. They couldn't actually play either side. Well, I was smashing people. You know, the ball carrier for Parramatta was on a hiding to nothing early in the game, and, you know, the Eels just they, they just weren't in the game, were they? You know, and I think a lot of people, I think even the most died on the wall Penrith supporter was probably quite uh, sh- well. There was shock and awe. There you are, a bit of George W. Bush on your program this afternoon. Go on. There was a bit of shock and a bit of shock and awe from Penrith because, given that uh, Parramatta had the wood on them this season, let's not forget that. There were some question marks whether Penrith probably, you know, were nervous about playing Parramatta in a grand final because the media was basically in a frenzy all week. Everyone jumping on this Parramatta bandwagon and people like Mick Cronin came up from Gong to be with his beloved Eels. Ray Price came down from Tweed Heads just on the Queensland border. Peter Sterling was there. So they had all the luminaries. It was all about Parramatta breaking the drought not so much about Penrith going back-to-back. And I think uh, it might have been Billy Slater said last night, and I agree with him 100%. It's one thing, Marty, to win the premiership, particularly in the NRL, where the talent equalisation is as good as anywhere in professional sport on the planet. But to retain the trophy, to successfully defend the trophy... That is something else. And, you know, they're still on top of Mount Everest in rugby league and full credit to them. Jason Costigan is with us. You remember this voice, of course, called the Warriors for over a decade. Now firmly ensconced back home. But, look, I totally agree with you. And when you actually start talking about dynasties now, and and I know that the Roosters have gone back to back, but prior to that, it was Brisbane Broncos, 92, 93. And prior to that, it was just a few years earlier, it was Canberra. You've had a great run from the Melbourne Storm as well, where they haven't gone back to back, but they've made successive finals. This is a dynasty in front of us here. And when you look at the age of those players, uh, especially, like, look at their halves, look at their front rowers, for example. I mean, these guys, they aren't finished. That's what I was looking at last night, Jase. I was sitting there thinking, this team, I don't know if they could go back to back to back. That's unheard of since Parramatta did it, I think. But, I mean, this team is capable of that. Who's going to beat them next year? Well, I think they probably will start shortest price favourites since the NRL came into being post-Super League divide. That's the 1998 season. Look, I haven't seen the market, so I'm not a mad punter by any stretch of the imagination, not at all. I have a flutter once a year on Melbourne Cup Day, just to put things into perspective. But, you know, you put put the question to me, Marty, on your program this afternoon. I reckon they'll be the shortest price favourites, uh, premiership favourites, in a long time early next year. You know, with Carousel and people like uh, Kikau moving on and so forth. But, you know, Cleary is so good. Uh, you know, and both coach and player, uh, as I said earlier at the top of our discussion, so many young players coming through. They are chock a block of talent in the lower grades. It shows no signs of abating. And so, you know, Parramatta were the last team to go bang, 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 81, 82, 83. Jack Gibson, the legendary Parramatta coach, when they first won in 81, he said, ding dong, the witch is dead. I wonder what Cleary might say if they can go three in a row next year. You talk about Nathan Cleary, oh sorry, Ivan Cleary there, the coach. Okay, so he leaves the yep. Warriors. He, he'd, he'd, he hadn't won a premiership himself as a player. Uh, then he gets ditched by Penrith. He gets picked up by the Tigers. He goes back to Penrith. And now look at what 
the man has created. We're sitting here on this side oh. of you know of the Tasman, thinking you know as the club, and you've gone through that. What they've won the under 18s, 19s, 20s. I said at the beginning of the program, Costa. I said, look, if they lined up the hot dog sellers, I bet their best 13 would beat everyone else in the place as well. This is you know they've created a monster around themselves. Why the hell can't we do it sitting here in Auckland? I look at Auckland and I think this is like Monaco creating this mega franchise. We got five million people to choose from. Not all of them play rugby league, of course. But why the hell can't yeah. we get something like that going? Well, in terms of pathways, look, you know, everyone's supposed to be on an equal level, a level playing field with the salary cap. But what doesn't come into the cap is how much you pay the coach. So if you and I own the Warriors, for example, you know, let's say our last name's Robinson. Well, you know, you can pay the coach whatever you want. That doesn't come part of the cap. And, and they have this nursery out there in Western Sydney. Uh, and it stretches beyond the Blue Mountains up into central western New South Wales. They've got talent scouts everywhere. You know, they've had talent scouts going around a long time ago, getting players from all over Queensland, New South Wales, New Zealand and whatnot. That doesn't come into the cap. So they're very well resourced by the Penrith Leagues Club, which is a gambling palace of epic proportions. Let's not sugarcoat it. It is a license to print money. Yes, COVID has knocked them around like so many other businesses, whether it's the humble uh, milk bar in, or dairy in New Zealand through to some sort of big uh, conglomerate. The, the pandemic we know has had uh, an impact economically on everybody uh, and no different to Penrith Leagues Club. But historically, they've been powering since, uh, well, for a long time. And uh, it shows no signs of abating in terms of their success off the field. So when you've got the money, when you've got the moolah, you can do a lot of other stuff as well. You know, the high performance unit that they've got out of Penrith. You know, I mean, I was calling the rugby league on Sky Television when it was unveiled. And I was so proud to show it off. I was down in Canberra about 18 months ago with Ricky Stewart and Don Ferner. They were very proud to show me their toys. West Tigers have got a new centre of excellence. I call it the centre of mediocrity. <laughs> but, all jokes are, but, but all jokes aside, it's going to be a great uh, boost for the West Tigers. But Penrith led the way, along with, I suppose, the Broncos, if you like, which is a, a different uh, kettle of fish altogether. But, you know, they have become this superpower, not just in terms of playing talent, but off-field and commercially. Their Panthers uh, on the Prowl campaign in the local community is the stuff of legend. They go out there and work with their community. There's a lot of battlers, a lot of people that are on Struggle Street in their catchment area, in their neighbourhood, in their community. They connect with their community very well. So you've got to give Penrith a lot of credit, uh, not just with what they do in first grade under Coach Cleary. He's done an amazing job. Ivan's a smart cookie. I remember him fondly uh, when I first met him through my great friend Kevin Campion. After all, they came to Mount Smart together, not on a package deal, but they turned up there, obviously, a long time ago, they played in that grand final 20 years ago. It was a great thrill for me to call that grand yeah, final brilliant. with Ray Warren, Ray Warren in the box next door. But Cleary has learned about rugby league. He's been a great student of rugby league for a long time. And don't forget, a lot of people forget about Nathan. His mum is the sister of a former North Sydney player, Josh Stewart. So he's got great pedigree with his rugby league genetics. And he, he's been a kid that's grown up with the game, learning off his father. So, you know, I don't think the talk of a dynasty is premature. They've gone back to back, and I think they're probably very well placed to keep it going. And as I say, just coming back to what I said a moment ago, they'll be the shortest price yeah. favourites for a premiership trophy in a long time when markets open. I don't know when they will. I'm happy for people who listen to your program to phone in and say, no, Costa, you got it wrong but I reckon I got it right. Well, what was before we go on to the naming of the Kiwi squads and the Kangaroo squads, Jason Costigan with us on the platform here. Okay, um, you, what was your moment last night that sealed, that sealed it? I thought at halftime it was actually over, and I know they scored a couple of tries, sort of garbage time, but I actually thought I thought the third try was, was the absolute killer in the first half. Well, I think Penrith was uh, put Parramatta to sleep in the first quarter. You know, I, I don't know what Brad Arthur could say to his team in the, at halftime. Halftime couldn't come soon no. enough. You know, that first half dragged on and on and on. And, uh, you know, I mean, some people are saying that Parramatta played their grand final against the Cowboys. They probably did. But there was so much love and affection and sentiment out there for Parramatta. And, uh, you know, there was some, uh, obviously, some uh, talk during the week, some teasing, some taunting during the week. I see the comments coming from Jerome Luai, who will be such a linchpin in that Samoan team that will take on England at, uh, up in Newcastle in the Rugby League World Cup opener, teasing the Parramatta players, basically saying, come to daddy. Yeah. Well, guess what? 
They Daddy did. Stood yeah. up last yeah. Night. Daddy, Daddy, yeah. Was six, Daddy was six foot two, tall and bulletproof. Costo, back to you, mate, for a couple of minutes. Uh, just before we get to Mel, the Kiwi side, one warrior in it when we used to dominate this. We used to have just about the whole squad in it. What's it telling you? Well, I'll come back to uh, what, what you didn't ask me, and that is the best New Zealand players don't want to play for the Warriors. That's not a real popular thing to say in your program, Marty, but I'm going to say it. The best New Zealand players don't particularly want to play no, for obvious, the Warriors. It's obvious they don't. You yeah. know? And, and, and but but no, not many two, not many people want to see it. I don't read about it too often. But I think Maguire's got a terrific squad. I think Bromwich is a you know going to be a, a great leader for this particular tournament. Uh, you know, I welcome the selection of people like Chris uh, as a debutant. You go and compare the debutants in the Kiwi World Cup squad to the Kangaroos. I don't want to jump ahead of our discussion, but there's 13 debutants in the green and gold and only a handful for the, the men in black. I think New Zealand are well coached by Michael Maguire. I've been talking to Madge actually uh, in the last few weeks. He's very confident that they will do well uh, in the north of England. And, of course, they've got an important warm-up game coming up against the runners-up of Super League in Leeds Rhinos, coached by, of course, the, the son of uh, Brian Smith. Uh, he, he started his career as a video analyst, don't forget, with the Warriors 20-odd years ago when Daniel Anderson was the number one man at Mount Smart. And Rowan Smith's going to coach those Leeds Rhinos against Michael Maguire's Kiwis in a very important World Cup warm-up game for New Zealand. I think New Zealand uh, will go very close to winning the tournament and a lot of pressure on England going into that first match against Samoa because those Samoans, they are dead set, not going to be a walk in the park. I think they're a powerful side. And I think England is in for a rude awakening in less than a fortnight. Finally, then, this Australian side. Now, I remember laughing, guffawing actually out loud when when World Rugby League, whatever the body is called, put out their rankings and had Australia fourth. And yeah. it's like, I mean, for God's sake, man. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't care about COVID. I don't care how many times they played, haven't played. I don't care. Australia going as the top seed at every single Rugby League World Cup. Like, they're going at the Cricket World Cup. They're going as the top seed. That's just how it is. So what Mel's done this time, though, is he's obviously, you know, this this whole thing about players going back to their their islands of origin or or, or how, however you want to uh, phrase it has actually really cost that that Kangaroos squad a lot of the players they probably wanted but is this side with all its debutant can you see it being as strong as always I, I just I just can't see a weak Australian side turning up for this tournament well you I mean we, I don't think we've had a weak Australian side I just want to come back quickly to New Zealand well done to Scott Sorensen as well because of course he's the grandson of uh, Bill Sorensen who played in the first three Rugby League World Cups uh, remembering our World Cup started before the Union World Cup Marty 1954 uh, so, you know, he comes from great pedigree. And, of course, he's the nephew of, of Dane and Kurt. But in terms of the Kangaroos, we always put out a, a very competitive side. But there's 13 debutants out of 24. I haven't done the maths, but how many of these players have actually played in English conditions? I think it's going to be a learning curve for a lot of Meninga's players. Of course, he hasn't got players that he would have liked at his uh, disposal. They've pledged their allegiance to various nations. I think that's very healthy for International Rugby League. And I think the IRL, look, you know, people can bitch and whinge and moan about the rankings. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think Australia are raging hot favourites for this tournament. I think Tonga, coached by Wolf, with the players that they've got, will take some stopping. I wouldn't all be surprised if England don't even make the final of the World Cup. There are five teams, Marty. I'll just sum up by saying this. There are five teams that I believe are capable of winning the World Cup and only one in the Northern Hemisphere. That's the tournament host. But if they bomb out against Samoa in Game 1, well, who knows what could happen. But I think at the end of the day, we're going to see some surprises in this tournament. Uh, 16 teams, of course, in the men's. Don't forget the women's, the wheelchair. They've also got the physical disability rugby league. Uh, Look, I think it's going to be a great tournament. There's been some controversy in the last couple of days with the Fijians, with the boss of the English rugby league. Uh, basically poking fun at the Fijians at a function. It went down like a lead balloon. I believe he's apologised to the Fijians. The Barty don't want to say too much about it, but uh, Ralph Rimmer, he's been certainly causing some headlines in the north of England. Personally, I think he should fall on his sword. Uh, It's overshadowed a lot of the talk leading up to the tournament, but there's so much excitement, Marty, with Rugby League World Cup with the five teams, Samoa, Tonga, obviously the Kiwis, Kangaroos in England, all in the mix to lift the trophy at Old Trafford.